All right. I am now recording with uh, three cool people. We got Russ, we got Monica, and we got Matt. And today <clears throat> uh, we're going to do an introductory sort of discussion on two uh, archetypes from the Jungian perspective. Um, I'm mostly going to try to go off of the Practical Jung by uh, Harry A. Wilmer, but this is sort of introductory, so we might be a little all over the place this time, which is fine. I'm going to try to do a couple more of these in the coming weeks, um, where some will be over the uh, internal archetypes, which is kind of like maybe a little bit of a review of the map of the soul, um, but more focused on archetypes, and then, you know, which is uh like the shadow the anima animas persona all those kind of things um and then the external we'll probably do in a third one but today it'll just kind of be like an overview to just start getting into it um so and that distinction is, is really important because um that is so much of the dis dis distinction in art and philosophy and the humanities and everything else is that between the I or the me and the not me and all those things that goes into all different kinds of um, uh, humanities is, is, is what that is and how that we deal, deal with it, that there is this phenomena of uh, myself as an individual and other people that are not me. And how do we deal with that? And the unconscious way to deal with it is through uh, projection and then we don't realize that we're doing that. And so we're projecting out archetypes and those. And I'll, I'll say this weird thing that I sort of noticed when I was like reading up on this is it's presented often like it is like these archetypal images are just sitting there in the unconscious and then they come out where I'm not sure if I, th I think that, that might sort of need to be updated in the language, but maybe it's just me, is that I think it's more like what's in the unconscious is just the archetype, as, as Jung calls it, the self. And uh, as that, that comes out and interacts with the rest of the self or the structure of the self and uh, the ego and, and it's projected out, then it comes out in these universal images. It, so it's, it's sort of a phenomenon that comes from going through the structure of the psyche or the mind. But uh, yeah, there's just kind of like a little uh, introduction in ways of what we'll be talking about here for the next uh, hour or so. And uh, let me just give these three wonderful people uh, a chance to briefly introduce themselves and maybe uh, a quick idea of what they might want to talk about today, and then we'll dive into it. So, uh, Russ, you're here with us, uh, even on video. Yes. So, uh, yeah, go <laughs> ahead. Hi. Uh, so, I'm Russell Yetto. Um, I'm from um, I'm from Galway, New York, which is close to. It's upstate. It's actually closer to like Boston than it is New York City. So, <laughs> we're kind of like north of Albany, sort of. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, I, I work as a meat cutter. Um, I work at a, uh, it's a commissary, uh, which is like a, we do like cuts for military and it's at a lower cost. So it's uh, something I've been doing for about eight years now. And I, I enjoy it. It's been, you know, it's been cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I've been, this has always been like a, uh, something I've been getting into is just studying Carl Jung and uh, Jungian psychology is very interesting to me. So we've just been kind of like, you know, captivated by it. <laughs> so, yeah, totally. <clears throat> yeah, Russell's been with us uh, kind of since the inception or even pre daily archetype through some other <laughs> Facebook groups. So it's been interesting. Uh, Monica, yeah, do you want to tell us anything about yourself and what you might want to talk about or anything else? I'm um, sure. So I'm, I live in Chicago. Um, I'm a mom of three kids and I have always been interested in psychology. That was, I guess, my focus of study in um, undergrad and grad school. Um, I, 
I, I just feel that uh, even having been through a lot of talk therapy and whatnot, like that doesn't um, cut to the chase. And um, it's, it's uh, I've been listening to a lot of uh, podcasts of Young and um, not doing a lot of reading about him, um, to be honest. Uh, but just fascinating stuff that really, um, I think like to all of you, it just seems to make sense. And there seems to be somewhere deeper to go into and uh, find some solace in the fact that there's just something unending. Whether it's your shadow or whether or not it's not. So. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, Matt, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hey, uh, thanks for having us. Um, my name's Matt. Um, from San, San Francisco. Um, I'm a graduate student at uh, California Institute of Integral Studies. Uh, so there's a big focus on uh, Jung there. Um, currently doing some research on Mary Louise von Franz. Uh, her collected works, uh, I think, are being, I think there's like three. I think there's like, like they're planning on having tw like 28 volumes or something. Yeah, there's three out now, but yeah, there'll, there'll be 20 something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. I got that too. <laughs> the first one. Uh, so I'm having fun sort of reading through that. Um, and yeah, uh, you know, read, read the black books, read the red book. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's just really interesting. And, you know, a hundred years since, uh, there's a whole lot of different perspectives. Um, and it seems like uh, the sort of Jungian branches are all sort of uh, going into different directions. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing um, this branch, <laughs> so to Thank speak. You. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, we had one other person just join us, the, the, the final person joining us for today. And I don't want to uh, mispronounce your name. So uh, t uh, what we're doing right now is we're just going through a quick introduction and then we're going to get into the discussion and I'll, I'll go from there. So uh, tell us how, you're, how to say your name and just anything about you and what you'd like to talk about in terms of Jungian archetypes. Hi there. My name is, uh, I go by Anna, but my real name is Nezana. Okay. I guess I just want to learn more about what you have to share and then I'll go from there some sounds good um okay so yeah we'll, we'll get into it and let me see i'm gonna do um some of this i talked about in like a brief introduction i gave and um what i'm gonna do is go over some of the images um but again i'm trying to deal with this dichotomy uh, or should I say dichotomy, this phenomena of the individual self and the not me, the, the somebody else or the, the individual and the other, the person who has their own ego consciousness and the other, uh, which is basically what is projected upon. And um, th there might also be another phenomena within that that you could say is um sometimes like art or media so in other words like the artist might uh put together a piece of art whether that's a book or a movie or and it doesn't have to be an artist it could even be an engineer or whatever they put together a work and then um we have to figure out what it is and and how that we're going to deal with it and in that process what we'll often do is um project upon it and there's nothing wrong with the projection. Um, you know, sometimes people act like, oh, we're just going to quit projecting. Projecting is wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, it's not that there's anything necessarily wrong with projection. The, the, the problem with projection is when we do it unconsciously and then we act like we're not doing that. Um, so what we want to do is become aware of the projection and then we can even become aware of all these archetypes, including the, the ones that are inside, sort of like the structure of the psyche. And then 
um, that helps us understand how they project outward. And then uh, we'll be in a good place to understand when those things happen um, to not be sort of uh, taken by them or, or, uh, or uh, taken over by them even, but instead we can, it, it's fine to project all these images, but if we do so um, consciously and we do so aware, we can have fun with it, we can play, we can use it for a means for growth. And okay, so that's why I was gonna share this one first. I um, assume you guys can, can see it now. And I'm just doing it through my little Facebook thing only. <laughs> only because um, uh, it helps me just be able to uh, sort of like flip through it. Uh, and again, these are all images within the book, Practical Young. Uh, Nuts and Bolts of Jungian Psychotherapy, uh, illustrated and written by Harry A. Wilmer. So this first image talks about what I was just sort of getting at, is that we have our consciousness. You could call this area um, ego or ego consciousness, or at least that's where the ego is sort of at. And then it connects with the persona. And the problem with the persona is, you know, it's like we identify with things and, and sometimes we'll have multiple personas, which is, I think, something even mentioned in, in this book. But uh, we, we might even have multiple personas, like one that we might have with our family, one that we would have with um, other people, uh, like such as at work or wherever that we might be. And, and that's fine as long as we're aware of it and not um, just taken off guard by it and then in denial of it. Um, that's all fine. Um, and so in the middle of your persona is your, e or your, your ego is between your persona and your shadow, which is not really listed in this image. But in that process, you're projecting out your ideal into your persona and then trying to show that to the world, which is these things that you project upon the, these things outside of yourself. And then behind that is your, even in the, sh in the shadow realm is the sort of uh, personal unconscious, although that also gets into the collective unconscious too. <clears throat> but um, this is so within this world of the uh, consciousness is this internal structure that is the psyche, which includes all these um, internal archetypes. And we'll talk about some of them a little bit today. Um, so there's the, the inside ones which like I said, the, the first one that we talked about is like persona, there's also ego and some others. Um, so this is the, the first little image in the, in the book, which is, um, I like that even though this book was written like maybe I think uh, almost 30 years ago, it's dealing with the word affect. And the, so the, the interesting thing about the word affect is uh, it's sort of synonymous with qualia, although qualia isn't very well defined, but affect or affective valence uh, is, and it's, it's uh, pretty scientific. It's, it's basically, um, so if you see something or you identify with something or something comes to mind, um, the, the, the way to think of, of it affectively with an A is like, does it do something to you viscerally in your body does it does it um uh impose any kind of emotion upon you and if it does then um and it's not just like whatever i'm, I'm something very straightforward uh but you're you're dealing with a symbol then you have an affective image that will um you can usually break down then into the um uh, the elements of, of archetypes. So basically that's all to say that all this is um, sort of like the construction of reality and we're just kind of in the middle of it and dealing with it. Um, before I, I get like too, too much into anything else, um, I just want to stop for a minute and just kind of like uh, see what you guys think and, and if there's anything to, to add or, or anything else, and then we'll, we'll yeah, just kind of keep going through some of this. 
I'm good. Okay. Makes perfect sense. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Anything, Russell? I was thinking about how mm. um, an A effect it's caused by like like an emotion. Mm -hmm. Emotions sort of tied into that a lot. Um, that's basically all I had with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I guess. I guess. The, yeah. Like I said, the reason that's important is because, um, in, in other words, I could show some images or even some words. Like sometimes uh, Young would work with these kind of things through like you know, word association tests. If, if you uh, look at some images or we just say some words like mother or uh, table or um, brick, or, or you, you, could, you could run through any, any words or any, any images and some of them will have um, little to no affect, but then some of them, and, and this is why um, originally it started out when Jung was uh, sort of, figuring all this stuff out, he would do it off of uh, what became the lie detector later, the, the skin, F it's a weird word, epicephalogram or something like that. I'll have to double check, it's a weird word. Uh, but basically it's a skin connectivity test because um, when there is an emotion, like it's, it's felt in the body. It's not just like, oh, that's nice. Uh, but then what's happening is there's a connection with the image, which is sort of um, what this actual image is trying to present is uh, if you, and, and so the, the way that, that Jung had to go through this because it's tough with some of this uh, mental stuff because you, you can't do it exactly in the scientific experimental method to um, sort of isolate causality. So you basically, the way that he built this out was with his patients, but then also looking at um, like thousands of years of history and, and fighting patterns. Um, so it's more similar in a lot of ways to something like uh, archeology span or uh, sociology, uh, finding these patterns and then um, putting theories with them. So uh, these patterns would appear uh, throughout history and throughout all of his like thousands and thousands of clients. And then he would say, okay, why, why is there this pattern of uh, uh, what we'd call today affective valence, meaning um, a certain way that we interact with, with images and uh, a certain way that we interact with uh, words and ideas um, and it, it seems to have an evolutionary base and sometimes there there's a, a a little i don't know metaphor or analogy that i use is that um or, or how i think about it is if you've had dogs you might have noticed this that they they all like a uh a leash because that means they're gonna you know get to do their thing go for a I can't say the W A L K word because my dog might hear it, but they all like uh, a leash. They like that image, but an image that could almost seem similar, even though like I've never hit a dog is they have an ingrained image of a stick because some dogs in their evolutionary history uh, may have been abused or hit with a stick. So it, what's, what's strange is even if a dog has never been hit um, and knows to be aware of a stick and uh, but at the same time even though a leash or a rope can look very similar at, at a glance even though dogs don't have great vision like us um, they know the difference a wiggly line <laughs> is great a hard solid line is to be feared it's, it's almost like an ingrained uh, image it's like a, a universal um, idea within dogs that humans don't exactly have but the, the reason that humans have the uh, images that they do is because uh, we have a different reality a different sort of uh, path in life which is uh, to deal with um, what Jung calls individuation which is sort of like um, synonymous almost with enlightenment or salvation to use some 
almost religious terms, but you could just call it uh, maturation. Um, so uh, anyway, go, going through these images. Um, so we're in, so this is the internal. Th this is a good example too of how um, the internal anima animus. If you put two people together, then you can see how that there, there's the internal projection onto the external, and they go back and forth like a a dynamic. Because sometimes the uh, in in terms of like intimate partners, romantic partners, spouses, whatever. Um, they'll project their ideal upon each other. So that will have a certain advantage and maybe a disadvantage, but then they will um, <clears throat> sometimes also project um, their, their sort of like the villain of a woman and the villain of a man projected upon each other. And, and sometimes that's tied up in a person's um, relationship with their parents. Sometimes it's tied up in the person's relationship with authority. Sometimes it's tied up in a person's um, unwillingness to mature and be a um, dependent upon responsible adult, all those kinds of things. Um, but what that's getting at is the anima animus, which is the, the man projects um, certain ideals and certain, uh, so positive qualities and negative qualities upon um, from that are, that are initially repressed within themselves. Um, so originally, so we're, we're all, and this is one thing that like Freud, Jung and Adler and everybody basically agreed on is that we're all basically uh, the same men and women, but as that we go from children to adults, our biology changes us to have certain biological, physiological differences and certain cultural differences. So then um, we repress uh, to some degree parts of ourselves that might be uh, contrasexual, that might be from the opposite sex, and but we still like those things, but we, we repress them. So it might be like a certain kind of creativity, nurturing for a man perhaps, uh, and then for a woman it might be assertiveness, uh, that she repressed those kind of things. And because she wants to do that, and then she sees it upon um, a man that she's projecting upon, for example, then it's like either her ideal, like, oh, there's my hero, my knight in shining armor, or there's like my repressive slave master. <laughs> so this is kind of the, the idea of the anima animus, which again is the, um, the internal... Uh, uh, it's an internal, well, what's interesting, again, is there's the internal I, and then there's the external not I, and um, and that's that's really important. Like, I think there was a line in this book where he made the distinction that um, the schizophrenic, they've lost their I, they're, they're overwhelmed by the not I. Um, so basically, when you're a child, uh, sometimes it's called participation mystique or mystical participation. You don't understand the, the difference between yourself and the environment. You just kind of think everything is just everything. And you're just kind of like a part of it somehow. Uh, but then as you become like a full fledged um, individual with ego consciousness and everything else, after you're at least a few years old, um, then uh, things are a little bit different. You're, you start forming memories different, everything else. So your your journey between coming becoming a child and an adult is understanding your identity. And if you do that, if you understand your identity as an individual, it's great. You want to have a good, um, strong ego, not an inflated one, but a, a good, healthy ego. Um, then you're, you're going to be you're a healthy person. Uh, the only problem is sometimes that can get... Um, inflated or deflated which is kind of like um egotism or then it can even result in depression if your ego is deflated so you want to have a good balanced regulated uh ego and then um and and sometimes that will go through its ups and downs throughout life um, but then you have to deal with the fact that there's all these other things that are not 
your ego identity, which are other people that have their own agency and their own bodies and responsibility and everything else. Uh, but again, all this is just to make this distinction, like with Anima and Animus, they are uh, people projecting out upon the um, upon each other. And, and most people, they just go through their romantic relationships and they're like, why don't relationships ever work out? <laughs> And you know, why, why is it that everything's so great for a few months or a couple of years and then it falls apart? Well, uh, probably in about 90% of the cases, this is exactly why they're, they're unconsciously projecting. Um, and, by, and by the way, like this subject is really interesting. That's why I put on the podcast um, like a, a few weeks ago, uh, We by uh, Robert Johnson where he goes into the mythology of uh, romantic love and he, he really breaks that down. Um, he doesn't use, I don't think he uses a whole lot of the anima animus, but he, he talks about it as, you know, uh, it's pretty similar in, in terms of projecting um, sort of ideals upon each other, which, which can't last forever. It can only last for a period of time. And then uh, you have to like love each other as, as real individual people which is a great thing if a person can get, can get there. Um, well, I, I guess I'll just uh, double check, triple check in with anybody and see if anybody has any uh, questions or comments or anything. Um, I can kind of like continue on or, or whatever you guys like. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, sure. I think it's worth mentioning um, that uh, what Jung called archetype, you know, before that he called uh, psychological energy or psychic energy. And before that he called it instinct. And before that he called it libido. Um, so it sort of speaks to the sort of evolution of his thinking. Uh, and maybe along with that, um, what was interesting was his idea of participation, mystique, and I think the collective unconscious and synchronicity was also um, based on Levi, Levi Brühl's uh, participation mystique, um, which was based on, you know, quote unquote, uh, primitive religion. Um, so, you know, there's a sort of colonial uh, anthropological lens um, that this is based on, which um, is interesting sort of uh, today with a, a kind of different mentality with regards to indigenous people. So thought I'd bring that up. Um, yeah, good point. If you, um, yeah, I think the Jung's map of the soul is really interesting. And, um, you know, because if you like go over the collected works of, of Carl Jung, like some of us had tried to do, um it, it is it is a little that way it's it's kind of all over the place where sometimes it's like okay are these energies are these libido are they libido energy are they uh self are they archetypes what is what's going on here um which is because uh yeah he and actually it's interesting i think matt mentioned earlier uh studying marie louise von franz because she probably did um, you know, most of the research and translation of um, what got put into his collected works, at least in the, uh, the later parts with alchemy and things, um, which is, again, where he got basically his anthropological ideas of finding these patterns uh, throughout history for thousands of years. But then also the patterns were very... Um, um, what's the word more they're more well-defined within alchemy which is which is why his, his later works um started relying heavily upon the the symbol the symbolism in alchemy because basically that the alchemist uh you know there, there's a lot of different ones but uh their process for hundreds or thousands of years was to uh work out the same issue which is what is the structure of the uh, the human psyche and how that it, it interaction and how that energy and thoughts and ideas flow through it, uh, which the alchemists had kind of figured out, but they, they kind of did it through uh, their images and their experiments and everything else. Um, 
And, and also that's the reason why it's interesting to get into some of these um, more modern or contemporary uh, youngins because even Marie Louise von Franz, um, and then I would also say Marie Stein, the, the one we're sort of talking about today, uh, Harry Wilmer, uh, definitely Ed Edinger, um, just because, like I said, he was Jung was building this sort of uh, theory for, you know, for decades at least, and and decades during both the world wars. So it, it was you know strange times to be building such uh, in depth theories, but but that's what he did. So um, and that's why. Like um, another book I was going to mention, oh, I grabbed the wrong one. Um, probably, if okay, so one one another important thing to mention is that um, Carl Jung. I think, and I think this aspect is sometimes left out a little too much, which is it's at least it seems to me and and i think some others like uh, Murray stein who who studied this pretty in depth which is that the areas that there there were some areas that young didn't touch a lot just because they were covered like um uh the sort of like animalistic nature and the uh sexuality he didn't say freud was wrong he said he was right and there's all the other unconscious stuff and all this other stuff that uh, Freud sort of um, denied. So we didn't go a lot into what Freud did. He said he's basically right about that, but what he's wrong about is leaving out so much of the unconscious. Um, another area which sort of gets into the uh, hero mythology, which is sort of like the uh, external archetypes we'll talk a little bit about, is uh, he promised his wife, Emma Young, that um, she could write her own book on she could write her own book on the grail legend so the grail legend i'll probably get into later this year but uh it's interesting because um emma young spent about 30 years writing the grail legend and then you know her her take on it and then she got she got cancer and all that uh, in her later years, and she had Marie Louise von Franz uh, finish it. Um, but that's that is to say that Jung didn't talk a lot about the external archetypes. He talked about the child a lot. Of course, he talked about you know mother and father, and some other phenomena like rebirth archetype. But he didn't talk a lot about the external ones. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about, about those today. But the other one is Origins and History of Consciousness by Eric Neumann. And the reason is, is because um, it's another uh, similar look to uh, hero mythology. He goes into a lot of other things too, but it's mainly about hero mythology, which is the idea of uh, this idea over time compared to a thousand or thousands of years ago uh, has progressed in terms of like the ideal individual and the, the ideal hero and everything else. And some people, um, I think that's great and some people uh don't like the idea of individuals <laughs> and I, I, I don't know if we'll get into that today but so, some people don't like the idea of that there is an ego or there are individuals or anything else it's like everything is just like the self is an illusion the ego is an illusion everything's an illusion and there's some truth to that but it can it can be confusing because there there is a real phenomena of uh what each of us are individually and what each of us are as we interact with each other and collectively and everything else. Um, so good points. I'm going to go get back to some of these um, images. So this is kind of um, what, what we call this like a <laughs> here's, here's a guy just saying weird because uh this is him looking at he's looking at the the hated well so go we'll start with the, we'll kind of gotta, gotta go top to bottom here which kind of like illustrates some of the points i was making a little bit ago which is the ego sees something and then unconsciously his shadow projects upon it so he's not seeing the other thing he's actually just seeing his um 
unconscious projection from his uh, shadow, which can be both his personal shadow and the collective shadow and a cultural shadow. They can all link up together and that can be, get projected on another person, whether that's um, you're a person's brother or a president of a country or uh, your boss at work, you can project the shadow upon them. And then you think they're like uh, the worst thing ever in the world. Um, and then what that comes down to is it's like what you thought was what, what's really just like a person uh, looks like the devil, which is this, what this uh, image is, is attempting to show here. And so this next one um, sh sort of shows uh, how to, how we integrate a shadow, which uh, it starts off just like we explained on the, the last image from the book. Uh, there's the shadow and then, uh, and then there's the other and you're uh, basically having a conflict and with the, the well, it's similar to the anima animus phenomena, but it, it doesn't necessarily, when it's shadow, it's not um, a contrasexual thing. It can be projected upon anyone. Uh, so you're projecting upon each other often because once one person's like, you're the devil, then the other person's like, no, you're the devil. Then you're projecting upon each other, then you will think you're the devil. And then uh, another book that I re recommend on this is... Um, Projection and Recollection of the Shadow by uh, Marie-Louise von Franz. I know it has a longer title that I always mess up, uh, but Marie-Louise von Franz has an important book on the recollection of the projected shadow. And then the, the idea there is that you befriend the shadow, which might just all sound um, like a nice fairy tale, but the idea is um, to understand that all those things that that have given you an affective valence of negative and that you have put in that box of evil or bad or irrational or whatever, um, from a certain perspective, they have a redeeming quality. And they so you can um, befriend the, sh the shadow and then like um, everybody lives happily ever after. <laughs> Well, not exactly, but it's a, it's a new uh, dynamic. So this is is now getting into the um, what do you call it? The external um, archetypes. Well, see, this is what's interesting about it. So it is external because we would project it upon um, something else, like a character in a movie, or maybe it's a president that we like, or um a historical figure that we like or something else we might say that's our that's my hero or that's our culture's hero or that's the hero of the good people uh i want to be like that or, or maybe even a religious figure like buddha or christ or um uh, others and so that so you project it out as like that's the the external ideal but then uh sometimes you will identify with that and then um, like I think it was Piaget and there, there was a number of others that talked about how one stage of development, usually in a person's um, uh, young adult years is they'll, they, it, if they're not careful, they could fall into like a, a Messiah complex. Uh, but that's basically where they over identify with, with a certain uh, hero archetype. Um, so there's there's like a, a right and a wrong way to identify with with even the positive archetypes. Um, it's also some a lot of times will happen again with uh, schizophrenia cases is you know they they will say that they are some type of a messiah and um, so what it what it did is it it took the idea of a good um, a good archetype a good idea and it kind of like um took it to its rational conclusion almost uh almost too far as is what happened there um so it's, it's something to, to be careful of but this is exactly why that we enjoy um political drama religious stories uh fictions um all kinds of things where we can um 
identify with the story of a protagonist, a hero, someone who has to overcome things and go through that in different ways. And then we don't have to fight the dragon ourselves, but we can learn about how people did and, and what it was like and those kind of things. Um, so I'll go through these uh, six stages really quick is <clears throat> the hero myth will uh, usually start out with a miraculous birth that's um, that's seen in different ways and in all different kinds of religion religious myths um, in in all cultures it's a some type of a miraculous birth um, and then at some point in uh, that person's uh, early development years will realize that they have some kind of superhuman power and strength, or it might even just be um, intellect or someone who can uh, walk with God or all kinds of things. Uh, but some, something superhuman will be about that person. And then um, there, there will be a sort of... Um, um, rise to prominence for the person and but then they'll have to overcome a an adversary the triumphant struggle with the forces of evil and you see this throughout um, uh, cultural mythology this is one of the things that's talked a lot about in uh, Eric Neumann's book and a bunch of others uh, of course Joseph Campbell's Heroes with Hero with a Thousand Faces and, and some other books get a lot more in depth with this. Um, then in, in some more, it, some of them will stop there, but then sometimes uh, we'll realize that the hero has um, fallibility to sin of pride and hubris. And so then they will uh, fall through betrayal or a, heroic sacrifice of death like um there's a bunch of examples of this like samson in in the old testament accounts as an example of that sort of uh end part that they don't all go through um th there's a lot of other examples of that but uh so that's starting to get into the sort of projected out archetypes and yeah let me just uh uh, yeah, open it up if you guys, I'm, I'm sure that must have inspired some ideas or thoughts or anything. Um, don't be shy, guys, if you have any uh, comments or anything. I, I just really, um, when you brought up Neumann, one of the things I love about Neumann is he's, you know, everybody's so into their psychological types, right? Like INT. JP or whatever. Um, but I thought Neumann was really great because he has this, you know, just this word of centroversion, right? Which is sort of almost what the psyche does. Um, you know, that that's its function, the sort of regulating, you know, bringing to balance, uh, sort of supplementing or complementing the uh, sort of lopsided uh, conscious type with um with what it needs to be whole um and so that journey of transformation of individuation um is just yeah really really fascinating um and i just very simple with the center version so i know i you know i did a little bit of dream work and and very much that theme of balance and hybridity and union of opposites is um is there so it's nice to um nice to sort of see that mapped out here um i did want to mention too um, can i oh yeah yeah go ahead no go ahead okay just real quick uh, actually the reason i brought up uh neumann the, the reason i thought of it before is because um carl jung wrote a, a short forward to this book and in this book basically what he was saying is if i was neumann or, or someone like him. And if I were to write a book, it would be this book because his previous, you know, essays and collected works, um, he was kind of saying that they could be condensed down largely into 
Neumann's book, The Origin and History of Consciousness. Um, and he expounded upon that idea a little bit more, basically saying that, um, you know, the, the sort of tough task that Carl Jung had was he was figuring this stuff out as he went, whereas those who came immediately after, uh, Neumann at least in writing a couple of books like this, um, were able to kind of like deal with those things after they were already put together. And then it kind of got condensed down into books like this. And, and again, um, this deals a lot with hero mythology, which um, Jung largely avoided because he promised his wife she could write that book. Uh, but that's why I mentioned those books that are about hero mythology. But yeah, go ahead, Monica. Sorry. Um, I was just going to talk a little bit, Matt, when you mentioned central version, I think that's the word you used. Um, so do all people have the potential of central version and cannot, but it's very possible that some people just can't access it or utilize it. And that's why they, they lean into um, the, you know, kind of taking on uh, what you said about Isaac, were you talking about external archetypes? I mean, am I hearing this correctly? Like if you, you may not utilize your center version. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear other people, but um, yeah, go ahead, my, my take on it is that um, centroversion is unconscious um, and it's, it's what the psyche will do. And so, you know, we are one type potentially, and we can, we can, um, you know, part of our individuation journey is to uh, sort of come into contact or relationship with those other types in order to to have a more whole understanding and so there's a tendency i think to um normalize one's own type as the you know the truth so to speak and so what mm -hmm. um what the psyche does and what centroversion does is sort of help us to move to those other types, but it's unconscious. And so I think what Jung does is to sort of bring that into consciousness, understand the uh, psyche's centroversion uh, tendency, and, and in making it conscious, uh, we can sort of catalyze that process. Um, and that's essentially, you know, what individuation, uh, sort of is what um, what psychological balance becomes, uh, what the journey to the self does, what dream interpretation is uh, for, um, at least as I understand it. I'd love to hear other people. That helped. I was thinking um, there's another book that Neumann wrote called the great mother. Um, the great mother kind of represents a lot of what the, um, the outer archetype or the outer world represents. I think that's kind of what that was centering on. It's a, it's a big book on the feminine nature too. And it has a lot of um, images and stuff in it. I haven't fully read it. I just kind of looked through a lot of the artwork on that one, but I just kind of was thinking of, in regards to Neumann. <laughs> Yeah, that's the one I grabbed accidentally. Oh, earlier, look at that. <laughs> which, which is has a, has an interesting story. Um, what's his, uh, Murray Stein, I think he did a, a YouTube series on this, or at least one or two uh, videos. Um, I, I forget who started it. Um, I don't know if she's credited adequately, but it was um, maybe... Jaffe or, or one of the like one of the sort of founding uh Jungians one of the other ones um and she she's basically she started compiling almost again like a archaeological or anthropological sort of finding these patterns in in art especially like basically showing that the main archetypal image in art 
for at least about 4,000 years, maybe more, depending on, on how you uh, measure it, uh, was that of the Great Mother. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's definitely, so yeah, the, the Great Mother is, is an interesting one as a concept and an archetype and as a book because um, it deals with the idea that uh, there's all this stuff and, and figuring, well, the, uh, the analogous word for it is matrix, um, but matrix in that uh, it, is, it is reality as such. And uh, so throughout our, our life, we, uh, and this is talked a lot about in the, the Eastern religions, at least of, of India, we basically go through these phases and stages of um, sort of becoming individual separate from the matrix of reality, but then reintegrating and becoming um, a whole part of the whole of reality again. And that's sort of like what Jung would call another take of this individuation process, which uh, is another thing that he, he did in all of his um, uh, in, in his writing is, you know, it's all about the individuation process, which he said was was natural. And it's sort of like just this modern world has kind of polluted it with this other stuff. Um, so we just kind of got to kind of like deal with the weird other stuff of uh, our modern mythologies that are very dis disassociated and disassociating. And then, um, we can kind of, and then we just kind of naturally fall into the nature of individuation, which is to um, mature to the point where we can help others mature, essentially. Um, on the on the idea of centroversion, um, I, I would basically say that, um, I don't know if this, bringing up this image again will help, but um, where'd it go? Um, so this, this is kind of a mandala, a mandala, there's two or three different ways to pronounce it. But uh, the idea is, is that mainly we break down to four primary areas. Sometimes, um, some people post young said that these are like, uh, warrior, lover, uh, magician and monarch. Uh, Jung mainly broke them down to the psychological functions, which are, um, it's, it's almost like a, metaphorically, it's, it's like the way that our, our eyes work, you know, like color doesn't exist out there. It exists the way that that short span of um, EM electromagnetic waves uh, interact with our, our eyes. And there's certain um, uh, colors that, well, there's two or three different color theories I won't completely go into, but basically uh, to, to the point of psychological functions, uh, the more you sense, the less you uh, feel and the more that, or in certain terms of sensation competes with feeling, or no, am I saying that right? No, sensation, excuse me, comp competes with intuition and feeling competes with thinking. Um, but then when you're having um, all these integrated, that would be sort of the archetype of wholeness. Um, another sort of modern idea that I put on this sometimes is uh, uh, the idea of flow or flow states or like uh, living in flow, sometimes it's called. Um, and th there's other more ancient ways to look at that. But the idea of when you get into, uh, sometimes it's called no mind. Uh, it's it's uh, a point where all these are, are connected because uh, normally we're in our we're operating in our type and our type might be um thinking and intuiting but then the other two sensation and feeling it's not that we're not doing them it's that we're doing them unconsciously but then when we're really involved in something whether we're um involved in a conversation or in a sporting game or our work our, our reading or then all of those four uh, will be dialed into it. You can even be that way if you're like really immersed in um, watching a movie or reading a book. They, they all, you just can get, um, you can get immersed in all of it. 
um and then it's just kind of like you lose yourself and and so and and so in terms of this centroversion idea that's that's basically how it's it's the sort of the axis between introversion and extroversion so instead of being like introverted sort of like in interior facing or extroverted having to have someone or something to project upon the centroversion is sort of like the axis of doing those both together so it's like a a coming together or betweenness um which is something that uh like matt was saying neumann talked a bit about in origin history of consciousness um you know, carl Jung talked about it but probably not um maybe not enough um and okay so this is another um example of how you can break up these uh archetypes with uh the mandala sort of symbol which is that it breaks down into these layers how that you interact and so basically you'll have a this is why that if you okay so like jordan peterson gave this example of how he would take his son to see you know maybe his, his son was only like six or seven years old and he would take him to see you know, a movie that might be rated PG-13 or something. And he his son would get scared or whatever. And then he would say, well, you're not going to be too scared if you just uh, focus on the hero. And and that's true because it can it can be very disoriented and dis disassociating if, if, if you just seem all over the place when what a story will do usually in, in like... Um, this, these modern dramas like these uh, sci-fi movies or hero movies or whatever is they will have a very clear this is the dark side or the evil people or this is the villain and this is the good guy uh, they usually make that really really clear and it's because we're acting on this drama that there's the hero redeemer versus um, the hero trickster which, which is the interesting idea that, that this um, image brings up, that the, um, the, the hero redeemer needs the hero trickster to redeem, whether it's uh, Gotham City with Batman and the Joker or whatever that the, the area or the, the world might be. They're, they're both somehow necessary. Um, you could say, in the sort of like anthropological perspective, it's like uh, that's Zoroastrianism getting mixed in with our uh, our other uh, be because before Zoro Zoroastrianism, you didn't really have a clear distinction of like a good versus evil. It was just like the ideal. Uh, other than that, you might just have sort of Im ambiguous uh evils which are things like um a dragon things like that uh monica did you, did you have something to say or or did you have to go sorry i i gotta get off because sure, i no just problem. picked up my daughter sure. um so if it's okay with all of you if isaac if you hold another one i'd, I'd love to join in yeah and um i just wanted to let you know i will get the book for the following time yeah, yeah no problem uh, but yeah, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, guys. This is fascinating. Thank you. All right. See you. All right. Good night. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we'll <laughs> get, a, get into this. This can be kind of all over the place. Um, and so, some of these as well. But um, yeah, that's that's basically it in terms of the, the, the images. I just wanted to, to use this one to kind of give that overview and introduction of um, uh, these images and, and a little bit of the way that uh, Harry Wilmer lays it out in, in this book, uh, which I think is, is good because it's pretty um, concise. A lot of the, the other books and videos and things on it can be a lot, like pretty all over the place, um, which is understandable. Like you and I was a little bit all over the place only because uh, these things like connect like uh, like in these huge webs of uh, you know time and space and all that. So um, yeah, so yeah. Any other uh, points of discussion or anything else? I know Matt and 
Russell is still here. So uh, what are you guys thinking? Um, in regards to that one with the hero um, redeemer and the hero trickster and then the two side heroes, it kind of reminded me of the uh, diagram of like a primary function and the inferior function with the two auxiliaries on the sides. Mm -hmm. Because it, like when they describe it, oftentimes like the inferior function is often seen as like the hero in that it's it's relied on last but it, you kind of have to develop it to pull mm -hmm. through like it's the last last man standing essentially <laughs> yeah sometimes they call it the the hero function yep. um which is it's because it's 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 always there it's almost like a overseeing um father or mother that's like uh staying out of the way but like watching out to make sure everything's going okay um uh, but but then in so doing um it uh you know you, you kind of get people kind of get mad like dad or mom why aren't you intervening well you have to grow up and learn how to fight your own battles but i'll save you if you're going to lose your mind <laughs> kind of thing <laughs> is, is how those works but if you uh over time get better at uh working with them and um integrate those functions then that's when you can kind of um uh achieve those flow states and achieve something like like lasting individuation, um, all those kind of things. Um, yeah. So, anything else? Yeah, I was curious. Um, sure, sure. The you mentioned the the king, the magician, the four sort of male archetypes. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and there and there's the female ones too. That's why I said the king as monarch because it's king or queen, and but yeah, there, there's male or female. But but go ahead. Yeah. No. Well, I. Um, I was wondering if uh, that came from Jung or if that was somebody else's interpretation of Jung. Um, good question, because I, I'd always wondered that too. And it, it seems like, I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly um, who, uh, so, so some will say it goes back like very, very pre Jung. Um, the, the ones who sort of popularized it were what G Gillette and Moore, Robert Moore, I think. Um, and, and they wrote a bunch of books that are, um, I think only some of them are still in print, but some of them you could get out of print on, on that subject. Um, but I, I only mentioned that because in terms of, and th there's a, there's a lot of other, other other ways that people will find that pattern of a primary sort of quaternity within uh, the human psyche. I, I think maybe who um, gravitates to that more is uh, the extroverts, <laughs> because mm -hmm. it, it, so like uh, if you you look at the um, the videos I was doing about a year ago with. Uh, Dr. Lahab al Samurai, he was really big on that, but well, partly because uh, he knew um, more in Gillette personally, I, I think, for a little bit because he was part of the Chicago uh, Jungian school when those guys and Murray Stein were there, but then uh, possibly or, or, or largely too, just because he's very um, extroverted. So I think a very extroverted person might draw more towards that idea. Um, and there, there's other ways that you can divide up the sort of four main divisions of the psyche that are often divided, but then they can unite and those kind of things. And, and other sort of schools of thought or psychology or philosophy, um, you know, I found, found it in different ways, but uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of different ways that you, you get at the psyche and you find a division of four that's sort of unified too. But, right. You know. Well, I, I know that because um, I know Jung's mandala, you know, had mm. the Philemon, um, Loki, and then the two shadow uh, or, or the, the light and shadow female. Um, and I also know, you know, 
Tony Wolf's um, feminine forms of the or structural forms of the feminine psyche also had the sort of four women, uh, the mother, the I think the friend, the um, oh, the Amazon and um, the God, the medial woman. So I didn't know if if the four male archetypes that you just mentioned were Jung's sort of male that was complementing Tony's for female or if that was a different so anyway so i was just curious if oh had... yeah um yeah i think i think tony wolf published that later and he wasn't yeah it's it's weird too because young was kind of always on his own <laughs> his own little writing adventures and you know he published just like essay after essay just with his own phenomena that he was um getting into and um yeah i think tony wolf published that later i haven't i haven't read it but uh like when um yeah and it, the, i guess the thing is too with that is gillette and robert moore were folk like a lot of their um focus was they had these men's meetings because it's kind of to, to focus on you know their their men so they're going to deal with uh masculinity and mas masculine psychology and it was a little bit of like a a movement back in like the late 80s early 90s or so um but they basically said there's the same thing on the female side but it's just queen instead of king and then female warrior female uh magician or you could call that a sorceress maybe and um you know female lover um and they all have their uh ideal side and then they all have their um when they get basically you know too uh too strong or too weak or too uh you know overly focused on the, the whole key to it all is to, to try to find balance um but also uh find find your strength within that too um and then some on that say um that the magician is analogous to uh, intuition, warrior analogous to feeling, um, lover analogous to uh, sensation, and thinking uh, analogous to the monarch. Um, but <laughs> I don't think that there's a complete consensus on that. So there, it's sort of like a I don't know, uh, a, a, a disputed theory or debated theory, at least. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the, the, the functions are, are pretty well accepted. Some of the details might be debated, but the functions are pretty well accepted. I mean, MBTI got uh, a little bit of a different direction. Um, th that's fine. There's definitely some tools there. Um, but the the functions are are very pretty widely agreed upon is the the only um i guess debate is like how to apply what we get from those functions um but yeah uh russell has studied the the functions and and that stuff a lot more than i have <laughs> yeah i don't know why i've been kind of obsessed but <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of like it, trying to make it clear you know because mm -hmm. there's so much different like y y it's hard to read on the internet and then it was mm -hmm. like finding a book that actually was um really good at explaining it um daryl sharp had uh written a book called personality types mm -hmm. and that's a really good one so that, that's what i recommend <laughs> and that's on inner cities website oh so, yeah yeah, that's the same one. Um, the same one that uh, what's his name? Uh, Edward Edinger publishes with Inner City Books. Mm. Yep. So, um, yeah, Matt just shared this with me. I put it on the screen now. Um, so you can find this. It's not. It's not very long. It's, it's basically a, a paper on um, the structural forms of the feminine psyche, which which seems interesting. Do, do you want to say anything about this, Matt? Oh well, I was just gonna say. I think um, 
you know, it says right there uh, 1956, but yes. I think um, it was republished after mm-hmm. being written in the 1920s or so, or maybe the 1930s. Um, and, you know, there's a whole thing with um, Tony and, and uh, Jung, but um, yeah, it seems like it seemed like they their work was complementing each other. Uh, in many ways and so you know I I didn't know if Jung took the male you know uh, psyche Tony took the female psyche and um, and then Emma you know wrote uh, Animus and Anima kind of seeing the relationship of Mm -hmm. uh, those two Um, but anyway it's it's definitely worth uh, reading and your your um, articulation or the core correlation of the different archetypes with the different um functions was helpful um and i imagine it's you know very similar to this as well potentially i also thought um you know, just because you talked about uh the sort of mother archetype and, and mother uh matrix matter um it's just interesting thinking of you know what we consider matter as an archetype and a mother and, you know, the sort of the, the male spirit kind of coming into matter and, and forming it in, in um, different ways, you know, very, uh, very Gnostic, very um, uh, you know, it's a, it's symbolism, but it's Mm -hmm. also like you were talking about with projection, we're sort of projecting that split in matter um when um you know if we integrate that if we sort of do our own work if you know we might find that um that separation uh between matter and and spirit um is not um not real or uh it's contingent on our own assumption of separateness so you know, getting into the sort of more spiritual um, uh, thing. Um, so anyway, it's uh, good, good food for thought. Thank you for this. Yeah, I, f- I found it here where Tony is making her distinction between uh, mother, uh, what is it, the, the material woman and the Amazon, and then interperson related in the middle. Now, what's the bottom one? So the, yeah, the hetera is, is basically um, the media. Uh, sorry, um, actually, it would. I think it's the friend. I think that's what the bottom okay. one is. Whereas the medial woman is the, um, mm. you know, and there's there's shadow sides for all of these, right, and light right. sides as well. Um, so the medial woman was basically that. Um, person who's kind of along the lines of the witch along the lines of the per- the woman who's connected to the unconscious um and uh so that can be um you know the problem with that can be the inflation uh the um you know sort of going crazy because you're uh so connected to the um collective unconscious but um it's necessary to sort of reinfuse uh, a world with spirit um so it sort of seems to me to correspond with the magician right um yeah i mean yeah yeah, yeah. and and uh, what's interesting too is this line where she says uh they also can cons- correspond to uh the aspects of the male anima which yeah that makes sense though that um i think yeah, when did Jung start talking about anima animas? It wasn't. Uh, it must it, well, it was at least in the what, 1930s, but uh, which is fine. It. I think it's in the. I mean, I think it's black uh, black books and, and red book mm. for sure. Um, yeah. But it might have even gone back into the um, transformations of libido. Um, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's just this recurring um, uh, image uh, or um, split, and 
what what I would say that it is is um it's just the way that we interact with because you know I try to put it in like um I don't know uh a down to earth which is just that um it's, it's the way that people interact with reality based off of the structure of uh the psyche or our mind um and it's going to cause these um different divisions just just like the way that you know we see color a unique way because of the way that our eyeballs have you know formed over the evolutionary period with the rods and cones and everything else we uh see and identify with and experience the world a certain way because of how that our um psychological structure has evolved over uh a million years or so especially the last few thousand um but uh yeah it's it's just interesting too because like there's been a lot of studies even even young would would go back and and visit you know some of these um what, 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 like primitive tribes and things and he would you know figure out what's going on in their heads and they're very and their 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 sort of uh, mental structure even though they might be um relatively equivalent to how our cultures were over ten thousand years ago their mental structure in terms of um like what was the story he he gives a couple of examples when he talks about his um visiting tribes in africa and the um uh, native american tribes where uh they, they would have just certain religious customs that they would do and they wouldn't even know why that they do it just just like us like we don't we didn't even know why that we got involved in certain religious ideas or we did certain things religiously whether it was things that we would call religious or things that you know we, we would act out religiously um and not call it religion or or spirituality or, or whatever um but the i think the example with the ones in africa was that they would like every morning when the sun would rise they would uh spit on their hands and raise that to the sun and it would kind of like dry out and that would be like just their morning ritual and he would ask like why do you do this and they he would just be like they would say ah well this is just what we always have done it's just what we do every morning uh but he, he says oh it's a it's like a archetypal um acting out of the image of the the rebirth of a new day and taking part in the the recreation and the dawn of um, light and consciousness and illumination into the, the world again they're, they're acting that out even though they don't really understand it uh, just like we humans uh, even modern humans do the same thing in sort of different ways we just act things out and if you're you're like why do you do that about uh, your religion or football or your country or a corporation or whatever? It's like, well, it's just how we've always done it. Well, maybe, but you're also kind of like acting out archetypal ideas that have been in us for uh, thousands upon thousands of years. And what he did then with uh, all of this research is he found this um, these structures and and you can uh, pattern out in different ways yeah there's definitely like uh, Tony Wolf was saying more um, feminine ways to deal with it like this there's more masculine ways um, his focus to kind of the the question you brought up was probably less on like a, a masculine view and more on uh, the cognitive fun functions um, you know that we talked about a little bit um, but yeah so yeah, anything else guys <laughs> russell you probably did more uh preparation Any, anything else that came up when you're like looking at the book or anything um we were talking let's see i was i was looking at um let's see we there was the section on active imagination um i was thinking about how like there's a lot of um opposites and like when we have like an extreme opposite like when we, we go to one side, we, we got to kind of work it towards, you know, getting it back to 
mm. you know, that it's just, we don't want too, too much one-sidedness. That's kind right. of the balance. And I guess I'm learning this, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting too the effect that archetypes have on people and how like it makes them so dramatic. <laughs> I'm kind of getting that. Yeah. That's the big thing is it's a, it's a, um, it, it can make so much drama <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I just find that interesting. <laughs> yeah, the the big difference is how much a person is um, conscious. It's like I think there's that mm-hmm. quote like, um, "Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life, and you'll call it fate." Is something that Carl Jung said, um, which is the idea of being aware of the archetypes or not. So. And they, like, there's so many things you can be aware of. Like, you can be aware of um, whatever that it is, is, uh, you know, power structures, hierarchy, patriarchy, all these things that, uh, and, and, you know, these things like archetype, these things that uh, most people aren't really aware of. And then when you become aware of it, you don't want to be like, oh my God, there's uh, archetypes everywhere and, and power structure and hierarchy, patriarchy, and, you know, anything else that maybe people aren't normally awake to or whatever um uh, i forget the schopenhauer quote off the top of my head but you know basically said like after you understand enough human nature um it it should be like the way that a geologist looks at a rock um you know you, you can just see these things like archetypes happen and then with the knowledge of them then you can um make yourself and those around you better but if you don't have any knowledge of them it can uh overtake you and then and then you'll the the thing that'll happen too is is uh if if you look at anybody who doesn't know what's going on you're like oh you're just acting on an archetype (laughs) or you're you're just being even even if it's something that that's more like sort of uh accepted like you're just being egotistical or whatever then they'll get like super defensive. No, I'm not. And you are, or <laughs> that's stupid. Uh, it's the, because they're unconscious of it. They're not doing so like with uh, a conscious rationalization. It's, it's almost like these ideas have them, they're acting upon them. But if it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, that's uh, the metaphor of like the elephant and the rider or the horse and the rider is if you or, or you could even say the dragon and the dragon rider is that if you just like say oh the dragon or the elephant is just too powerful i don't want anything to do with it or i'm just gonna pretend that it's not there you know it'll throw you around lead you around drag you around um and then you'll you'll have to kind of like rationalize it somehow but if you can become aware of these um forces these archetypal forces that flow from uh each person's unconscious mind and gets projected then you can enjoy it you can enjoy the ride you can direct the ride um you can be uh you can have agency over it instead of it just taking over you you, it, you can still let it like free and, and wild sometimes um but uh and, and there's a lot of redeeming uh you know life and energy and that but um yeah it's, it's something that we have to kind of like develop over the course of our life and i don't know the, the reason too that i brought up the whole like um make making this like clear distinction between the the inner and the outer um sometimes when people get get onto archetypes they just like want to be like i identify with the caregiver and I don't identify with the uh, outlaw and this and that. Um, and that's fine. Th- those are just like aspects that we can all sort of like project archetypal energy upon, like self energy, libido energy, whatever you want to call it, uh, psychic energy upon. Uh, but those are really going on inside of like all of them are inside of everybody, just some of them more consciously than not. Uh, and so the ideal is to uh, just like, that one slide where you befriend the shadow like the 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 main or or one of the main things is to just like befriend the whole cast um and and the probably the best practical ways to do this this is like a um 
a, a book that I, I got into and I, I, I know uh, uh, Russell was reading it as uh, inner work by Robert Johnson because it gets into um, being able to do your own dream work, uh, which I know Matt mentioned, and then also um, active imagination because then you can identify all these things within yourself and you can also uh, identify it within art like uh, books and movies and everything else and then it just becomes a more um, exciting and enjoyable experience um, but yeah so uh, what do you guys think anything else um yeah I completely I get it it's like um I've been just kind of working on my own development and I think that inner work is a definitely a good book <laughs> for doing that um and I'm glad you referenced that for me because <laughs> I was thinking about that too um yeah definitely recommend <laughs> yeah um not all I got <laughs> that's fine uh yeah Matt you got anything else otherwise yeah we can uh wrap up just in just a minute and I appreciate you guys uh being a part of this yeah no i appreciate it um as well i um enjoying the conversation and um yeah i think um uh, marie louise von franz had a picture in her alchemy book of um uh and i think uh you know polly uh wolfgang polly sort of spoke to this when when the when he and jung were talking about the psychophysical problem um that uh you know the the archetype and the instinct are the same thing but um at the physical pole it comes up as instinct and the sort of like you know uh, physical drive that um is happening and uh at the psychic level that same physical uh pole is sort of emerging as an image that is um that is registering at a psychic level. So, uh, you know, those two are connected. And um, if you look at dreams and you sort of do your own work, um, what's really interesting is that you'll see how your unconscious images sort of slide into your waking life. And so your conscious life is sort of uh, happening on top of these unconscious images. Um, and so they'll come off as maybe different uh, things, right? So, you know, that, um, for instance, if you have a union of opposite imagery, um, that might be because you're in a sort of physical uh, situation that, um, it is, you know, it might feel good, it might feel bad, it might feel like anxiety provoking, which will sort of, you know, lead you to do these things. Um, but if you're able to sort of, yeah, recognize that imagery, like you said, I think, um, and uh, sort of, I think you mentioned ride, ride the dragon or something, um, which is, and I guess this is kind of, what I wonder, and I'm curious what your thoughts on are on it. Um, the idea that the psyche is, is sort of wild, so to speak. And the question of whether the goal is to like domesticate this wild psyche or to figure out a way to comport yourself so that you're not domesticating or controlling this you know, wild uh, animal or the sort of instinctual nature within us, but you're able to sort of appreciate and embrace, you know, this uh, versus, you know, exerting control over it. So, I, you know, because it seemed like Jung was sort of very much like, you know, don't let the, don't let your anima kind of control you. You've got to sort of um, make her work for you, but, you know, his relationship to women was also you know, controversial to say the least uh so you know it's 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 a question i wonder about 100 years later um yeah i would say um 
Yeah, we all have our issues with uh, others, <laughs> whether that and some more than others with with other genders, and that's not to uh, re relativize um, those things. Um, but in, in terms of, um, is it better to let the so that the extreme of letting the the unconscious or the instincts go wild is um, hysteria. Um, and so we don't want that. Um, so a more controlled hysteria for like a, a good outcome or like a more directed or positive affect, you might say, would be like that, uh, the work of an artist. So the, the, the great work of an artist isn't like a, a complete control and it's not a complete um, uh, letting go of control either. It's kind of like... Um, you know, maybe steering a ship or, uh, you know, taking a, a, an animal and, and sure, you might let them run wild for some periods of times. And then you, you, you team up with them some periods of time to uh, take your ego consciousness to go somewhere with them and, and take that somewhere and, and do something like you would do in a creative work. Like that's, I think what we do. Um, like if you, if you engage with, uh, even literature or even studying in a pure ego driven way, you get nothing out of it. <laughs> like in, in, you can read a book and there's, you get, you got nothing out of it. You can uh, get an, get a hundred percent on an exam. And then you don't remember any of it a day or two later, you know, that's like a pure uh, sort of like ego driven, just like give me what I want out of whatever that I'm getting involved with. Uh, but a more, um, directing the um like in a harmonious balance in a consensual harmonious balance with the unconscious then um both expand and and develop into life and reality uh so it, it helps that person the the artist the the student whoever it is that is engaging with their uh endeavor it helps them to grow and to mature, to individuate, as Jung would say. Um, which, you know, the thing with individuation, like I said, some people don't like the idea of, of that word because they don't like the idea of individuals. Um, but the idea is, is kind of the opposite. It's that you become such an ind individual that um, you have, like, the, the, basically you become so mature, <laughs> uh, sort of air quotes on mature, but you've become so um, uh, whole, was probably the best word. You become so whole, but yet within your own specific wholeness, within your time and place that, that you are, your, your sphere of influence and everything and your work and your uh, unique passion, that that's completely individual. But at the same time, it, it, it identifies and becomes sort of one with the um, universal. So it's completely unique at the same time, completely universal in that it's part of the collective, collective unconscious. And then it uh, read, then it's it, this is sort of like the, what, what a hero does is it becomes so um, renewed by the hero's journey and the descent into the underworld and slaying the dragon, all these things that an artist or a hero does, that it brings something back to the, um, the culture. And what it brings back to the culture is, you know, just like the, the dragon will hoard, um, you know, gold and treasure. Uh, what that is, is that is uh, consciousness, that's um, growth, that's um, information and knowledge that the culture needed to survive because if, if the culture stays too stagnant, then the culture uh, will eventually, you know, wither and die. So we constantly need uh, heroes and artists and um, innovators to dig within the depths and then pull out um, unique things that only they can do as an individual. And then as they do so, they end up identifying as, um, or connecting with that um, 
collect so they're connecting with the collective unconscious which is universal and then they put it out in sort of like the zeitgeist or like a collective consciousness and the tricky thing is we only see the the external part but the internal part which is them connecting with sort of like the the matrix the uh sort of wild archetypal forces that's universal so they connect with that they bring it out in their unique way in the unique time and place that that a person is an artist a hero uh, a creator innovator and then they have accomplished something and and sometimes that's like world changing and sometimes it's like a good uh game a good <laughs> conversation uh it has its all of its levels and all of its its different ways that it interacts but the 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 converse of that is to basically just be like most people are is just like um unconscious zombies <laughs> because they don't want to deal with themselves and they don't want to deal with the the pain and struggle of transformation and, and growth um but i don't know if that helps the idea is just to um that, that it's that it's a it's, it's a process and good things come out of the process um and that it's a consensual process <laughs> you know we uh, we don't like in other words, we're not like um, imposing our will upon nature. We're, we're yielding to it, including uh, human nature in ourselves and human nature in, in others and the nature, um, the psychological nature that, that's in collectively in, inside and within culture and how that we interact with re reality. We don't um, force or, or um, pillage it. We um, negotiate and we, th there can be a, a wrestling there. You know, sometimes I think of uh, like Alan Watts gave this story of when he was walking with <clears throat> uh, Carl Jung in front of his um, house on the river and there were swans, I think. Yeah, swans and swans are kind of famously have this thing where first they fight and then their fight turns into lovemaking, which I think is sort of what, what goes on with um, our struggle with nature internally and uh, with our projections and everything else. There's a battle, but then eventually we surrender and there's like a sort of like a transcendent coming together. Um, and the the battle is almost like a um it's like a it's a, it's just a necessary drama for the the individuation or the maturation process you know it, it doesn't come free it, it comes with some um some pressure upon uh ego consciousness i don't know i don't know if that helps but you know it's it's a this is like a process that spans lifetimes i guess is the, the tricky thing about it yeah well i appreciate the uh the point about consent i think um mm. you know oftentimes there's a desire to extract you know the sort of value out of the unconscious or the dreams and you know what can i get out of it and so there's a sort of mm uh take without give um and so yeah i appreciate um your comments on um on that and um yeah i also was curious if either of you wanted to take a shot at applying any of these ideas to the uh russian invasion speaking of uh consent and uh projection and uh you know all of these things considering it's a pretty relevant topic these days uh and you were sort of mentioning um the sort of internal war that i imagine is uh, very much externalized here but um yeah any any thoughts on that or maybe for another time um yeah i'll just say it's um th th there's some that's really tricky just because we don't know all that's going on and and the, the, i think the main thing that's going on culturally um you know you can psycho psychoanalyze the russian people and the russian military and whoever else but culturally what's going on is that nobody knows what's going on and and 
people don't like not knowing what's going on. And so if you look, if, if we could time travel forward in time, you know, after this resolves, whether that's in a few months or a few years or whatever, then it'd be like, oh, look, that's exactly what was going on. Duh. But right now we're in the state of, um, we don't really know exactly what's going on. And especially uh, the Russian leaders are completely clueless and probably just acting out of self delusion. Um, and then, yeah. And, and I guess in terms of this, like uh, uh, the, the thing, the thing about a consent from like the unconscious is to me, you know, I, I almost think of it metaphorically like a, um, like a biblical motif in that, you know, certain things, they're, they're called like gifts from God. Um, and so I, I would say it's the same thing. It's like, we might, um, th that's how it should be re received, whatever we want to call that, whether we want to call that goddess or unconscious or nature or reality, it's, it's a gift. And um, sure, so, some, some people want to like steal their gift or unwrap their gift early and <laughs> whatever else but it's it's given to us by uh nature and the unconscious because it's a um it's a loving mother uh, that is nature and the unconscious it's not a devouring mother or you know the nature of the unconscious which would be to be overprotective and overly involved um, so it gives us space and then gives us gifts as that we uh need it and demand it um but yes yeah, in terms of the, the russia thing we just um the, you, any, anything right now that you can say you can you can you can put some some certainty on certain things but <clears throat> it's mostly like throwing spaghetti at the wall <laughs> right now it's like you can say like look i thought of this and then and, and maybe a, a month or a year you'll say look my spaghetti stuck on the wall um and the, yeah there, there's just there's just a lot there that, and it's it's not just that too it's just that um i don't know the, the one thing that we we do know is that um you know what i i feel like this this is supposed to be the post war era post at least cold war post at least uh, World War II era, but some cultures, Russian culture, for the, for example, in this case, um, are still stuck in that pre or or, or in that Cold War era way of thinking, um, which is to annihilate the enemy with uh, bombs and guns and tanks, and um, you know, often. Jung would talk about this um, astrological age, not so much as like the astrology is going to predict predict something like uh, some people treat astrology, but um, that we're going from the uh, what Piscean age to the Aquarian age, and the thing about that for us living in this uh, time that we're in, in sort of like the dawn of the 21st century is um that it's it's not either one it's both transitioning and and i mentioned that because as that we transition to hopefully i, I would and i i really believe and and i think you can empirically see that you know and and that's why I, well i i am really happy that it seems, at least for now, hopefully not getting faked out, that, you know, the West isn't rushing in to, to you know, like, blow things up. That they'll help and support their, you know, who, who the, the innocent or, or whatever. Um, but they're not rushing in to, to do more bombing and blowing things up. In the past, that, that was always, that's kind of like an old paradigm thing. And it, it's the old paradigm because of economics and it's the old paradigm because we're going through that cultural shift. And so <clears throat> I, I would think 
that we're almost to the point. Hopefully we'll get there by the end of our lifetime. And we're, I think most of the way there now where we no longer need to blow things up and, and destroy the enemy uh, physically. Uh, maybe we'll have ideological war or, or ideological war will have us or something like that. Um, and I think we're in, in that transition, but a lot of people are still t- stuck in that old um, uh, paradigm. And yeah, that's, that's where we're at. We're, we're, in, we're in that transition. We're like literally seeing that transition play out where it's like one or two countries, maybe three countries are in that old paradigm. Um, and maybe a handful of others that are less active. And then the others are like, no, we're in this paradigm where <clears throat> it's information war, not bomb war. And <clears throat> excuse me, so, some other things. So uh, what do you think, Russell? I was just thinking it's really hard to tell <clears throat> what's going on because of how much of a smoke screen the news is. Sometimes <laughs> It's just, it's all over the place. And so I, I, I usually try not to make too much judgments on this stuff because I always feel like I might take the wrong side. I'm usually like, I try to keep an open mind, (laughs) but I know something is going on and I know the the truth is, you know, there it's just, it's sad and crazy that, you know, and and as somebody was in the military, it it was like, um, you know, even then it's, not, I wasn't like really high in the chain. So I, but I know things, you know, happen a lot differently than they shows on the, on the news. Like that's something I think that's common knowledge to anybody who's in the service, (laughs) you know, it just, the experience is a lot different and it hurts a lot of people. And that's, that's just the sad part. Right. Um, Yeah. I, I, I saw a video, I think it was at the UN, some kind of negotiation where someone was reading, one of these Russian soldiers text. Um, and it was just kind of sad because every all the Russians were surprised that they were facing this opposition because the um, the the leaders, whether that's Putin or whatever the other leaders told them, nobody's gonna resist you. <laughs> they'll just either surrender or they'll happily, you know, uh, escort you through. Um, but to whatever degree that that's self-blindness or something like cultural blindness or things like that, um, it's kind of an example of these things uh, that, that we're talking about today in, in terms of, um, you know, some type of shadow possession or archetype possession or something like that. Although, you know, it's, it's one thing in our day-to-day life where that can happen and, people might just yell at each other (laughs) or be like, you're not my friend anymore. (laughs) And, you know, that's kind of unfortunate, but it's another thing where it's like, you know, people are are losing their, their lives. Um, But it is, it is important in that the better that we can understand these things, um, hopefully over time, it will, you know, become less and less, of uh less violence physical violence at least because hopefully we're we're, we're, we've been i think struggling for somewhere between two to four thousand years this understanding that um there's other ways to um influence people other than violence Uh, because sometimes you have to influence people and sometimes you have to compromise sometimes you have to uh, deal with the person being wrong, you know, all, all these things when it comes to people having differing opinions, whether that's over a piece of land or a piece of uh, legislation um, or, or whatever. Uh, we've been talking about for at least thousands of years how to, um, you know, do that through the spirit of the law rather than uh material and physical violence um but uh i don't know what 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 do you think matt uh yeah no i appreciate um, what you're both saying yeah i was just um noticing some of those parallels you know we were talking about centroversion and and sort of um you can see with 
Russia invading Ukraine and the sort of European countries uh, trying to compensate and sort of selling weapons. And like you were also mentioning, the, the people had no idea because there's a sort of repression of, of this kind of shadow side. There's this... Um, uh, yeah, and you know, there's all also people who are projecting all of these things onto both sides, right? And and so it just it does um, get quite messy. And I appreciate what you're what you're saying about you know it's almost like this union of opposites can take the form of like all out war that is just you know externalizing this violence. Um, but there's also, you know, that same union of opposites and that tension um, can also play out in um, in compromise and, and negotiations and, um, you know, uh, both sides coming to a treaty or, or peace negotiations or something. Um, so I'm at this point just really curious what uh, Putin's dreams are. So, um, yeah. But uh, anyway, let's... Do, do you mean do you mean actual dreams? I mean actual dreams, okay, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and and sort of what and, and you know how those dreams translate into uh, you know his conscious um, objectives and and the you know cultural psyche of uh, both Russia, both uh, both Russia and Ukraine. You know the people uh, who um, are you know, sharing the same culture, but maybe are on different sides of this, uh, this political boundary and, you know, nationalism as well as this, this other kind of collective ego that is um, more than willing to, um, you know, repress uh, all of that shadow material. And I mean, you know, United States is doing the same thing. There's you could sort of look at capitalism um, as, you know, people talk about, you know, the West and, and liberalism and, um, and democracy and uh, freedom. And yet there's the shadow side that, um, you know, all of these oligarchs are kind of repressing the people. And, and there's this sort of rupture between this unconscious perspective and, and what is sort of projected into the media as the, um, you know, what the leaders, uh, conscious goals are. So, um, yeah, it's anyway, I, um, appreciated, yeah. you know, Jung's, uh, sort of recognition that, um, these wars, whether it's nuclear war, whether it's, um, uh, what have you are, um, hanging on by it you know it's it's a psychological thread that we're all sort of hanging on and um doing the work around that um is incredibly important because without that inner work you know it seems like russia could you know impose its will on ukraine and for the next you know 20 years um there's going to be the same kind of sort of civil war rebellion that has been seen in Iraq and um, uh, in Syria and, and all of these things, or, um, you know, it, it could potentially um, shine a light into this darkness and, uh, you know, prompt a, a real inner work that um, does, uh, does work to kind of, you know, bring consent into the picture and um, and help all parties sort of individuate, but but not at the expense of you know accommodating uh, the soul to this fucked up um, social system that is untenable for everybody, but rather uh, working to figure out how to um, um allow or catalyze individuation for all parties and and not at the expense of others so yeah that's that psychological balance i think uh is both internal and external um so anyway yeah i appreciate the uh, conversation that um you're you're bringing up here
Yeah, I mean, I would say that kind of to start to close our interesting little discussion is um, where, where I, I think there's always been hope and always will be hope at, at varying levels, almost like uh, you, you, you see in the stock, stock market, you know, it has its ups and downs and whatever else. Um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes we can speak in these sort of ideals or absolutes like everybody or, you know, things like that. Uh, but um, throughout known history for at least thousands of years that, you know, the kind of history that, that we've lived in, a sort of uh, unified humanity sort of history, and probably even before that, um, individuals have always had the opportunity, you know, some, some more than others, depending on their time and place and everything, um, to do things like individuate and do things like, um, you know, even even going through really hard, difficult times to find to make it renewing, make it even somehow inspirational to others and and to uh, those around them. So I I think we're we're still getting that, and always, um, at least I believe it's it's increasing where more and more individuals have more and more opportunity to individuate if they choose to do so you know ju just like the 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 crazy thing about the phenomena of uh something like psychotherapy or you know things like that is the big difference is a person goes into it saying i want to heal and change and grow and those kind of things um you know and, and however a person does that whether they do it through books or study groups or facebook groups or uh podcast or whatever um that's that's the big difference is a person wanting to you know find ways to grow and heal and um and help others to do the same um you know that that's which is probably the biggest thing you can do to, to help or a person can do to help themselves grow and heal and all those things is to help others do so uh, and then, then that just becomes like a, a network of, of helping each other grow and heal and individuate and whatever else we want to call it. And I think the trend is in the right direction, um, but then there's always a competing trend. Um, but, but anyone can jump on either, you know, uh, go down either path or, or ride either animal, depending on um, what they want to do. And then, of course even if they ride the dark side for a while, they can go integrate it later. Um, but yeah, any other uh, quick closing thoughts? And then, yeah, it's been a good couple hours. We'll, we'll wrap it up and, and stay tuned. We'll, we'll do another one in the next uh, coming weeks. Um, okay, that's it. So um, yeah, or did, were you gonna unmute? Russell. Oh yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Yeah. So yeah, I really appreciate you guys. Um, we, yeah, we got, we got into all kinds of stuff, all the, <laughs> most of the archetypal stuff and, uh, the really deep stuff, like all of history and, and war and redemption and everything else. So it's been, um, really, really awesome and fun. And I appreciate everybody who uh, joined us, uh, including the, the three lovely, was it two or three, I think it was three, two or three lovely ladies that were here earlier. Sorry, there was one or two that were only here briefly. And uh, that's fine. We had Monica and uh, at least one other. So we appreciate everyone who joined us. And I think that there were some others watching live and this will be available um, on YouTube, at least for those who couldn't participate or watch live. So um yeah appreciate you guys and uh stay tuned and we'll we'll do more of these in the coming weeks and